welcome. Hi, everybody. This is Tracy Carnes, and you are watching the Pulpwood Queen channel. And if you haven't by now, uh, we recommend that you subscribe to this channel. That way you don't miss one episode of, of our discussions and videos. So please, please subscribe. And now, without further ado, I will introduce you now to Kathy L. Murphy, the Pulpwood Queen herself, sitting right next to me because she's at my house. I am at her house because we are getting ready to go to Nashville to the Southern Festival of the Book. And I'm doing a Pulpwood Queen Presents panel with, with Tracy, Casey Cowers, who's going to be my co-host, who's got a phenomenal book coming up, and Laura Bernhardt, a brand new author from Oklahoma, that's got a book called Red Rain. So, but tonight we're here with Trace. Trace wrote a book called Five Will Die. He has written lots of books. He just came into my trajectory and I'm finding out he's got a new book. But before we get into all of that, what all the readers and why everybody goes to the channel, what they wanna know is they wanna know about what were you like as a kid, Trace? Were you a bookworm? Were you a storyteller? Were you uh, into crime? I mean, come on, give us the lowdown on your, your childhood history. You know, for anyone who's read my backlist, which is for the most part, all either paranormal or horror or crime, you'd think that I probably had a pretty messed up childhood, but as far as... <laughs> As far as I recall, I was just a normal dorky kid. Um, I didn't actually love to read. I didn't I didn't ignite a passion for reading until college because I, uh, when I went into college, I uh, went in as first as a criminology major, but then eventually um, changed into an English and creative writing uh, major. And of course, in that major, you had to read constantly. So that was really kind of my first introduction to anything outside of what you'd find in, you know, a high school reading curriculum. But I didn't really read a lot as a kid. I was big into movies. I was big into video games as a kid. Um, loved horror movies, which some of the, some of those tropes kind of permeate into some of the short fiction that I write. But yeah, I just, I was just kind of your normal, typical kid growing up in, uh, on the Eastern side of Cincinnati. Nothing too exciting to share. I wish I, I wish I could well, embellish it a little more, but it's October and as we gear up for Halloween I just was with my grandson who's three and he informed me that this year we always trick-or-treat together that I was going to be a blob monster um, and I go did you see the movie the blob do you remember the blob Have I did I remember the original movie? one yeah well it starred Steve McQueen which blows my mind but anyway I said a blob monster why is that and he goes goosebumps he's into goosebumps oh uh, uh, yeah yeah and so he told me I was going to be a purple blob. So not only am I just a blob, I have to be a purple one. And I go, this is amazing. But I went back with him last, it was a couple of weekends ago. Yeah. We watched all the films that scared the living daylights out of me as a kid. We watched The Blob, which I'd forgotten Steve McQueen started. It's really, it's really good. But yeah. then we watched another film that I remember terrified me as a child. And it's funny because I'm the Pulpa Queen is, did you ever watch It Came From Hell? No. It's a story of a tree monster. Oh, fantastic. Well, you should see this tree monster. I laughed so hard through this film. And then the last we watched was The Creature of the Black Lagoon, which was interesting because I swear to God, that part of the scenes were filmed at Caddo Lake, which is right here in East Texas. It looks just like we went on a boat ride yesterday yeah. with all of our friends for our birthdays. And but what was the film that you watched when you were a kid that scared the bejesus out of you? You know, I think the one that really comes to mind is was uh, The Fog, the original The Fog. And um, I love that movie. Adrian Barbeau is in it. Uh, oh, it's a great, I know it's a great film. But the funny thing is, a few years ago, my kids wanted to start exploring, you know, horror movies. And as a parent, it's always tough, right? Because you don't want to uh, traumatize them for the rest of their life by picking something that's too scary. But they wanted something that was a little scarier than, say, like Hocus Pocus or something like that. And I remembered, you know what? I loved The Fog. So I still had the I had the DVD of the original one because they remade uh -uh. the film as well. And we watched it and they absolutely loved it. 
And my daughter has taken to horror more than my son has. She's a little older, but How uh, old are they? Uh, she's 14 and he's 11. Oh, so she yeah, now yeah. wants to get into the American horror story, you know, series and things like that. And my wife is absolutely, absolutely petrified of horror. <laughs> so I, you know, for the longest time I had no one to watch them with. Um, but now I can watch them with my daughter. So yeah, we're looking forward to that next stage and in, in well, uh, movie evolution. We watch these on YouTube and they're PG 13. So watch, the, watch the blob. It's more about, I mean, it's a, just a blob that moves really slow and people, yeah. oh, they just freeze when it comes and then it engulfs them. And I think, why don't you just run people I right. mean, if they just ran away, but it's so funny. It's like the slee stack from Land of the Lost yes. and they moved so slow and yet they still caught, you know, the family <laughs> all the time and they move slow. Yeah. Well, we yeah. watch my daughter's. And now they loved Hocus Pocus. We just watched the second one, but we love to watch um, um, The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock. Love it, yeah. And hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. That oh, one I haven't seen. Betty Davis, man. Okay, yeah. Betty Davis. But anyway, we, we're movie buffs in my family. In fact, we're running two book and film clubs right now. But so you were into The Fog. That's very interesting. And now your kids, have they... Have they read any of your books? So, yes, they have. They they have read. I wrote a book a few years ago. It was my fourth book, and it was called The White Boy. And it was actually the only horror novel that I wrote. And it was based, uh, I can share this because it's, you know, it is kind of the spooky season. It was based on a real experience that my son and I had at our house. And um, when he was really little, I think he was like three or four. And he uh, came and woke me up one night, uh, like 3 a.m. And he said, Daddy, there's a there's a boy in my room. Oh, you know, God. as a parent, you're like, <laughs> what? So I'm like, I'm waking up and I'm like, you know, this, this can't be right. So I, we run up the stairs and he's petrified. He won't go into his room. He's standing out in the hallway. So I go in and, you know, and I'm asking him all these questions. And he tells me, you know, he woke up in bed and he looked and we still had one of those gliding rocking chairs. It was a nursery yeah. at the time and uh, or before we had painted it when he grew up a little older, but we still had that rocking chair in there. And he said, um, you know, the boy was behind the rocking chair and he looked at me and I said, well, what did he, what did he look like? And he said, he looked like me, but he didn't have a face. <gasps> he called him the white boy because he said the boy, he was white. So I had I, that I couldn't get that out of my head, and oh, um, I can't. I, had I won't finished, sleep a week. <laughs> yeah, I had just finished my third novel, and it was with my editor. And I thought, well, I'm just going to write this short story called "The White Boy" and just kind of, you know, fictionalize yeah. some of the stuff that we went through that night. And it just kind of kept going and going and going, and it ended up it became a novella. It was like a twenty five thousand word novella, uh, oh seven goodness. or eight chapters is all. But the the first chapter of that novella is exactly what happened to my son and I that night. It's, it's ver almost verbatim exactly what happened. Now, then, so he never had an experience again, but the, you know, then I took a lot of liberties with crafting the rest of the story, but it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and that was the only, the only non-crime novel that I've written. I've written a lot of short stories in paranormal and horror, but all my novels, except for that one, have all been, uh, been crime. Well, I'm going to check it out. So, um, <clears throat> wow, you know, now I have to ask you, do you still live in the same house? I do. <laughs> I live in the same house. Um, yeah, he, we haven't had any other, uh, well, we had one other really odd experience I did, but um, my son has not had any other issue. And we built the house. It's not like there's some, you know, crazy history. At least I don't know about the property. I think this was old farmland uh, before they came in and just made a neighborhood out of it. But so um, that explains the bookshelves, <laughs> all the wonderful, wonderful bookshelves. Bobby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is I actually am, my. Uh, I'm envious. Of I am bookshelves. so envious of those bookshelves. They're not real. It's all just fake. You know, they're just like backs. They're not. Real. <laughs> I'm um, kidding. Who's laughing in the background? Is that your wife? No, there's not me. I'm in here all by myself. Well, I am here, but I don't know why. Oh, it's Sarah. Oh, I was really <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I'm laughing and I'm the ghost. I'm, I'm the white woman behind the <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing story. Well, that I'm going to go, I'm going to check it out. It'll be a one I can, my grandson is just three, but he is, a, he's a tall, older three, but he just loves this stuff. So um, that and charcuterie boards. Yeah, charcuterie. That's his favorite thing. I go, what are we having for dinner? He goes, let's have a charcuterie board. I'm going, my, he's three. He's three. Okay. Uh, but our, we're from a family of readers, so it makes a difference. Um, so do your kids like to read? They love to read. Yeah. And they, um, you had mentioned R.L. Stein a minute yes. ago, both for some reason I missed the goosebumps books. I, and maybe I was just b before my time. I don't know, but, um, I didn't know anything about them until my kids brought them home from school and they've read pretty much every one of them. And of course we had to watch every episode of the, of the television program as well. But yeah, my, um, you know, my daughter is now kind of moved into the YA stuff, which blows my mind. at some of the topics that YA novels will tackle. You know, when I was a kid, they didn't tackle stuff at all. Oh no, it was Gene and Johnny. Remember? Yeah. You know, yes. Yeah, yeah, super love. generic vanilla stuff. But yeah. And my son, uh, he's reading, um, uh, tracker, I think, right now, which was uh, I can't remember the author's name. He wrote Hatchet and uh, oh, Gary Paulson. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So oh, he's reading Tracker now. Yeah. So, yeah, they, um, you know, every year, you know, when they were younger, we would do the library challenge where they'd have to read so many books, you know, to get like an eraser or something like that. Um, <laughs> and now, you know, now they've moved on to much larger books, but yeah, they absolutely love to read every night. Uh, they read every night, which is great. I am so thrilled to hear that. Now, is does your wife read too? I mean, is she a big reader and read your books? Uh, you know, she's not a huge reader and she's actually pulling me into, she loves like movies and Netflix and all the streaming stuff, a lot of crime dramas and stuff. And uh, so she kind of pulls me into that stuff. And she's like the person pulling me away when I should be reading, uh, you know, like, you know, enticing me to do other things. But um I mean, she does read every now and then, and she'll read, of course, my books, but I never, she never sees the first draft. She only sees, uh, you know, the final, once it's already, once it's already out, uh, you know, then she reads it. And then she yeah. tells me what things that I should have done differently. But. Oh, well, that, that's, that's, you know, they always do that too. Well, that's exciting. So how did you actually, so you changed from criminology into English. And so you knew that you wanted to become a writer when you were in college? So I think I wanted to be a writer when I was in high school, but, okay. like, but like an author, right? To me, that was like a cowboy. Yeah. It's like you knew they existed, <laughs> right? But like, you don't really know, like, what's the career track to be They're an author different. or a cowboy or whatever, a ninja. It's like all these weird things. And, um, so yeah, but it wasn't until I, I got to, to college and um, my sophomore year, I was really struggling. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went in in the criminology um, as a criminology major and I decided I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. So I wanted to get out and I didn't, I really, I felt kind of lost. And so I went to my advisor, whose name was Jack Matthews. And, um, you know, we started talking and he asked, well, what do you like to do? He's like, not like when you don't have to do anything else, what do you like to yeah. do? No, right. I, I like to write. I like to write and I like to play golf. And I think we both knew I was never going to be a professional. <laughs> uh, but so it just turned out that Jack Matthews, who was a very accomplished author was on his own right, but I didn't know it at the time. He was the head of the creative writing department at, at Ohio University. Yeah. And he said, you know, listen, he said, come in, take one of my workshops and just let me know what you think. If you like it, we can talk about doing more. So I came in and it was one of these really small, it was like maybe 10, 12 students in the class. And it was just like a fiction workshop, you know, and all we do is we would bring select, it was almost like a critique group, basically. We'd learn structure and things and, and things like that. But for the most part, it was, you'd come and you'd share your writing. And I absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, so I changed my major and, um, but the, the funny thing was when I graduated, an English degree is like, you know, it's like yeah. a, get to bartend right I mean you, you really can't I mean you can do anything you want but it's not like it's it's special and um so it took me a while to really figure out how to become a writer I was in public relations for years I was an average I was an advertising copywriter for years I was a freelance writer 
So I was doing all of these things that kind of were tiptoeing around writing. I just wasn't writing the stuff that I wanted to do. And right. uh, I went to my wife one day and I said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not doing what I want to do. I want to quit. I want to leave this advertising agency and I want to write novels. And she's like, well, okay. You know, she's like, if you think you can do it, do it. And uh, so I did and I haven't looked back. You got a good one there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's super supportive, but because I think yeah. she told me, I, I forget exactly what she said. She's like, you can do something safe and be miserable at it, or you can go out and try and do something, even if you fail that you really want to do, you know? And I always thought I'd rather fail miserably at something I want to do than to succeed at something that I don't really care about. And the regrets, you know, yeah. I could have, should have, would have, you know, um, good for you. But I think that's, I hear this a lot from authors, you know, they go, I never really thought I could be one because I never knew one, but yeah. was this Jack Matthews, the first author you'd ever met? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, and he kind of, I think, demystified things a little bit because, you know, like when I was a kid or when I was younger, I loved to read like Stephen King, you know, it goes with yeah. the people. It was these huge icons, right? And you don't just right. kind of bump into him on the street. So it was kind of like, you know, wanting to be an actor, but have never met an actor or never really know how a movie is filmed, you know? So it was, he was fantastic. I mean, I wasn't, when I was in college, I wasn't writing anything uh, novel length. I was only doing short stories, but, you know, he really helped me kind of understand what a short story should be. And more importantly, what a short story should not be. And not every uh, idea you think you have works as a short story. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it was just, it was kind of a peek behind the curtain, I think, and just kind of gave me a foundation and an understanding of, okay, what actually happens on the production side to create something like this. What's your, what's your daily writing process? I mean, do you write, are you early morning? Are you late night guy? What do you do? I'm an afternoon guy. So I still do oh. uh, some freelance writing uh, uh, as well. And I typically will do that in the morning. Uh, and I usually start writing anywhere from noon or one o'clock on till about five. My goal has always been a thousand words. I just get a thousand words down a day because I feel like if you can do that, you know, you can keep the momentum you need to finish a novel. And um, sometimes I hit it. Sometimes I don't. Today, I think I wrote like uh, 3000 words, which was great. Um, my next uh, novel, my manuscript is due to my editor in mid-November and I'm like barreling through to get that one oh, done. Man. So I feel like I'm a little under the gun on that one. So I'm writing a little more than, <laughs> than I usually would. But. Well, you've got a lot of discipline. That's great. Yeah. You know, that's I think you have to. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. You have yeah. to, if you want to pay the bills, you got to be disciplined. Yeah. And that's, that's important because a lot of people, I don't know how many people have come up to me and they say, um, you know, could you help me get my book published? And I go, well, have you finished it? And they go, oh, I haven't even written it. You know, and you go, and I'm going, listen, yeah. I'm in the, I'm in the business of reading finished books. So when you get it done and published, come, well, you can't help me get it published. I go, I'm not a publisher. You yeah. know, I'm, um, yeah. I try to help first time first books or authors that to me, there's a lot of famous authors in certain parts of the country, but nobody else knows about them. I mean, I can't believe how many people don't know who Gary Paulson is. He is a terrific guy. I've done, I did the biggest event of my life with him uh, where I bust in um, 27 school districts into an auditorium to hear him speak. And as they left, they all got to pick up the pre-signed books that he they purchased from him yeah. it was amazing he goes where'd you come up with this idea kathy and i go i just create the events that i want to see yeah i mean i the first author i ever met was not until i was in my 20s and it was tippy hendren who wrote you know who starred in the birds i moved to california and she had written a book about, you know, she raised big cats, these lions and stuff. And I was fascinated with Africa at the time. And she put the little birds in it, you know, it was just like, and I just, she was just like this, you know, like Stephen King, you know, you just don't think, and I've met Stephen King. He's a super nice guy. I've met him too. And um, super nice, super nice. But, um, you know, it's, what people don't recognize is that authors are just regular people. It's just, this is kind of the way we express ourselves. 
and yeah. it, you can't help it. I mean, every author I've ever known said, I can't imagine, Pat Conroy always said, I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm not good at anything else, you know? And uh, he was a storyteller. So, uh, and I had not heard of you. And so Five Will Die, this is great. I just found out you have a new book out now called Catch and Release. And yes. give a little tease about that because it slipped by me. I did not know. And I'm anxious. Yeah, you got to get it to her. Yeah, I got to read it. I will, so yeah. Tell me about yeah. it. So Catch and Release, there's the this version, this copy here. Um, I write two series. Uh, this one is in the second series. It's the uh, the Connor Harding series. And Connor is an ex-mob uh, fixer. He's an ex, he's basically a problem solver. If you remember um, when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, the Equalizer was a big Oh, show. yeah. Really similar. I know, they, I know they brought that back recently, but similar type of character. Knight Errant kind of travels the country, helps people out of a jam. Typically helps people out who can't go to the police. But in Catch and Release, he actually is... Um, He's blackmailed by a retired hitman to help him uh, solve the murder of the hitman's wife and daughter that happened 12 years earlier. And the oh, only wow. thing he has to work with is the hitman has a um, a shoebox full of, uh, of postcards. He has a dozen postcards. And every year on the anniversary of the death, he receives a postcard from the killer. Oh basically, my God. Basically taunting him. Uh, taunting him um so he hires con well he blackmails connor he doesn't really hire him um to basically just take these 12 postcards and find this killer but the uh the postcards all come from different parts of the country they're not postmarked uh to one particular state or one particular city so he really has literally nothing to go on so just using these 12 postcards he eventually tracks down the killer uh, and it's got a great twist ending in it uh, that I won't give away, but it's well, a great, well, it's a great read that one too. I got to read yeah, it. Yeah, it's a good so, one. So do you get these ideas from uh, newspaper stories or where, where, do, where do you, does it just, where's this formulate? So this one in particular, believe it or not, came from an old episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Oh and yeah. I've since, I've since tried to find it and I can't. And I know they're now they're on like uh Prime or something. But I was uh as I was writing the book, I was trying to go back and find it. And I had never written the story idea down. And I probably so I probably heard about it in what 86, 87, and I just never forgot about it. But it was a similar story where this um, I think this daughter had been, this man's daughter had been kidnapped and they never found her. But on the anniversary of that kidnapping, he would get a postcard in, in the mailbox, basically taunting him, you know, that he would never be caught or that he would never see his daughter again. And I thought, oh, my God, that's absolutely horrible. And that always stuck in my head. And um, I was trying to figure out what is the case that Connor could work on that has to be so hard to solve that he's the only one who can do it. And that just popped back into my head. I never wrote it down in a journal. I never, you know, said, you know, I'm going to use this story idea someday. It just, it was back here somewhere rolling around. But I mean, most of the ideas, sometimes they do come from newspapers. Um, Five Will Die just kind of came out of a, a fascination of serial killers. Um, yeah. and I, uh, I recall being, one of the things that I, I find really fascinating about serial killers is this whole idea of them taunting the police right whether it be like the zodiac killer sent cryptid message or you know cryptic messages to the um san francisco chronicle or to the police department themselves and i always thought it seems so crazy because here's an individual who doesn't want to be caught but at the same time they're putting they're sending evidence to the police that could aid in the police catching them so one of the things that i always wondered about was had there ever been a serial killer who had written the police and told them that he was coming, like that he would contact the police before he murdered anyone. Because typically when you look at like the BTK killer and the Zodiac yeah. killer and even Jack the Ripper, you know, they committed their murders first and then they contacted the authorities afterwards. And I thought it'd be kind of weird if they had contacted the, you know, the police first and said, hey, I'm coming, get ready. And so that's kind of where that was the seed of the story. And I just kind of snowballed from there. And then I, I, I put that, I set that story in a uh, small town, which is really similar to the town that I live in. Uh, there's only about 2000 people in the town. There's a three man police force and they're just <laughs> ill-equipped. They're ill-equipped to deal with anything like this, yet they have to. 
because they know that after the fifth victim uh, is killed, they know the killer is going to leave. So they've got this finite, you know, uh, window of time that they need to solve this crime. So it was a lot of fun. I, I think uh, looking back at, uh, at all the books I've written, it's definitely one of my favorite, Five Will Die. It really is. Oh, I'm so glad we picked it. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think everybody has a fascination with true crime and crime. You know, I, Catherine Casey writes a lot of it. I've got a lot of friends that write it. Anne Rule was one. But um, it's amazing to me because the, the true stories are so unbelievable. You know, yeah. that it's hard to believe that somebody would actually do this, but I, I don't know, but I've always felt like serial killers are trying to prove to everybody they're smarter than anybody else, yeah, but they so. do, want, I think they do want to get caught. You know, I think you might be right. I think there are some, I know, watching uh, interviews where, and I forget who said it, but that's exactly what he said. He's like, I knew that I would continue to kill until I got caught. That was the only thing that was going to keep him off the streets. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's, I don't think there's any, I mean, you know, you can fictionalize anything, but there are some crazy cases out there. And my my third novel, which was called The Prison Guard Son, was um, it used the Jamie Bulger uh, murder, which was in there happened in the early 90s in England. It was kind of the it was kind of the O.J. Simpson trial in England at the time. It was I mean, it was massive. Everyone followed it. But it was about two nine-year-olds who had kidnapped a three or four-year-old from a shopping mall around Christmas. And unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't turn out too well. But they were caught. They were given new identities. They only served, um, I think, 10 years in prison. They were released. Mm-hmm. No, nine years in prison. They were released at age 18. And they were given new identities. And they disappeared. And um, so in that book, I, I use a very similar case. Uh, as kind of the, the the main plot of the novel. And my protagonist, Finn, who's a PI, he had to find these people in witness protection. Because one of the challenges I've always had coming up with plot ideas, especially with mysteries and PI stories, was, you know, the next case has to be harder than, than the last one. You know, mm-hmm. so you gotta keep up yeah. in the stakes. And I thought, you know, what could be harder than finding someone in witness protection? Because if, if they follow the rules, that's never been done. Uh, no one has ever, ever found anyone in WITSEC that unless they've outed themselves doing something by doing something stupid. So it was uh, it was an interesting exercise to try and figure out how you would actually do that. I can't even imagine it's Well, it, it just makes me want to read more and more of your books. So yeah. good for you. You're doing a great job. But, um, you know, the thing about um serial killers is what do you think the fascination is with you know, it's like a train wreck or a car wreck. People slow. What is it that I, makes people I, drawn to that? I don't know. And uh, I was just talking to my wife about this the other day. Because if you go to our uh, like home screen and Netflix, it's all yes. it's all a crime. It's all crime. Yeah, all and I don't know if that's, you know, her theory is, well, we tend to watch a lot of that stuff. So maybe it's just auto populating it. I don't know if that's the case or if that's just what everyone is into these days, but it's everywhere. I mean, you know, you can look, I think, you know, the serial podcast kind of launched the podcast, true crime, you know, revolution. And I don't know. I, I, yeah, I do. I think there's a bit of that car accident mentality where I want to experience this from the safety of my couch in my living room, you know, and I can can always turn the TV off. Yeah, Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I can live vicariously through all these other people you know, but I mean, it's, it's, they're great stories, right? I mean, because the whole idea of a good story, you got to up the stakes and what is, what's higher stakes than, you know, trying to catch someone before he kills someone else. You know, it's incredible yeah. storytelling. Yeah. You know? I, I binged The Stranger the other day on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. And that was amazing. I could not stop watching it. That was and then all of a sudden it was like 1 30 at night and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, that's the hard part is being able to stop. It was it was incredible. You know, have you watched the Dahmer one? The the Dahmer series. So I, we I, I couldn't watch it. Couldn't watch it. Yeah, we um we have we just watched. There's one on. There's one on. I think it's Amazon Prime. It's called Dahmer on Dahmer, which is just an interview with him. Yeah. It's only a two-parter, which we just finished the other day. We've watched one episode of the new Netflix drama on Jeffrey Dahmer. 
But um, I actually have a friend of mine named Mike who um, was friends with Jeffrey Dahmer in high school. Oh, he's a yeah. fascinating guy to talk to. Uh, he was one of my college professors. He, uh, but yeah, he he knew Jeffrey Dahmer, and he um, he was a character in um, My Friend Dahmer. Uh, which was a movie that came out a few years ago that was based on, I think, a graphic uh, or a comic book, I think, who was also written by uh, someone who grew up kind of in that circle. Um, so it was really interesting to hear some of his stories on on Dahmer as well. But yeah, but it, it's everywhere. I mean, I you know, we watched the John Wayne Gacy documentary and the one oh, on the Ted Bundy. Uh, Ted tape. Bundy. It's, it's everywhere, everywhere. But do you, um, do you think that people always get caught no i don't think so at all no i um, i you know i used to think you know it doesn't matter you're gonna get eventually you'll get caught but i think murder happens all the time and people get away with it yeah i do yeah. i i think um i i can't remember this statistic i came across it during some research one day that mm -hmm. i mean if you're uh and i'm not uh i'm not recommending anyone try and do this but if you're halfway <laughs> confident and you don't do anything too stupid and if you're in a big city where there's a lot of crime you'll likely get away with it just because they don't have the people to work the case and that's the sad part um but yeah in a small I, town you know you've got like you know three-man police force i mean i mean that was they, the whole idea <laughs> they don't have the resources yeah. um you wow. know but yeah i think you know back in the day and i think the we we watched one on the uh I forget which killer it was. It wasn't Zodiac, but it was someone who was operating on the West Coast. And this back then in the 70s, the police departments didn't talk to each other. So, you know, like no one knew what one person was or what, you know, what was happening even in this county over here. They just didn't talk. And I think it's probably much harder to get away with that stuff now yeah. just because of all the databases and the technology that's available. You know, and now you're finding with, um, uh, oh, I, now I forget who it was. It was, um, can't remember the uh, the gentleman who was just uh, just arrested a few years ago because his DNA was in a genealogy database and they linked them to some a series of murders. Oh, right. um, yeah. yeah. So it's like it, you never know what technology they're going to have um, to catch you. But I think it's much harder to get away with these days. But I'm sure I'm sure it happens. Well, I, I am, too. And it's fascinating. So, well, this is this is really great. So in the long term of your writing career, what would you like to see happen? I mean, what is your, you know, everybody has a dream of what they want yeah. to do. What would you like to see happen with your, you know, book? I would love to see some of my books picked up by either a streaming service or Hollywood simply because there's a lot of people that don't read, you know, absolutely a ton absolutely. of people that don't read. And I think there's some amazing uh, stories in here. Of course, I'm a little biased. So I want to get those stories out to as many people as I can. And, you know, I know that I'm somewhat limited with just the small, you know, population wise, the small percentage of people who read, um, you know, and I see it even with my own, even with my own friends, you know, they're, they're, they're streaming services and all these other types of entertainment kind of monopolize your time. So it's how do you break through some of those other, you know, boundaries. So that's, I mean, it's, it's nothing that I'm actively shooting for, but pie in the sky, I would love to see that someday. You know, every single book that I pick for my list, and I mean, this is, this is no secret. I see them as films in yeah. my head. You know, I, I visualize them and I don't put famous people in roles. In fact, a lot of times I would never pick who people, you know, I know on, Tracy's got a book coming out. And when I read it, I didn't picture the person she had in her mind when she was writing her character. And I never pick an actor. Like I never see an actor, you know, when I'm, I'm writing, I, you know, I have the character in mind, probably like you, but you know, I don't, ha I don't have a specific actor. And this actor kept coming up as the person that I saw as my character. And, you know, it was just crazy. So I just kind of ran with it, but you know, he'll never get cast at it, in it if, if it, if it ever gets picked up, but I write as if this will be a movie. I write. That's that exactly. Way. 
exactly what I. The best storyteller in the world are real writers, and so why wouldn't you go to our book club selections? plethora of outstanding talent and take every single one of them and make them in because they're all so different i mean you know we do historical we do crime we do suspense we do we've done fantasy we've done romance we we do both men and women all genres i i think that if a story is really great uh it would be so great if they you know producers would go to that author and say, you know, let's make this into a film and let's have you work on it. Because yeah. I think when the writer, I've seen like Cider House Rules, I've seen when the writer is brought into the picture, how much better yeah. it is. And I understand directors want to give their own spin on it, but I do think it's, I think storytelling in its finest is done in films. In fact, I just watched the... Indian version of Forrest Gump. Oh, really? I liked it better than I, I hate to say this. I love Tom Hanks, but I liked it better than I did because it I'm telling you the Indians are excellent storytellers because when you read as much as I do, and what I look for is books that I don't see it coming, you know. People that read the same author over and over, it's just like so boring to me. But when yeah. people can do books where you didn't see, you know, you didn't predict it, um, that fascinates me. I want to hear the story that hasn't been told before. And you're you're really good at it. So uh, I, uh, The White Boy, I got to get that book. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what would your advice be to... Um, no matter how old you are, a person that really wanted to get in writing, what is the first thing you would tell them to do? Well, it seems silly, but I think the best advice would be just sit down and write the book. People get so caught up in, am I going to find a publisher? Do I yeah. need an agent? Yeah. Is this written well? There, you know, you can, you can fixate on those things until, you know, you're blue in the face. Just sit down and write the story. You know, at the bone, you know, you're going to have to do that anyway, right? Regardless if you find all those things. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I think, I think writing is, and I, I still face this. I've written nine books now. And every time I start one, it's intimidating as hell. It really is. Uh, I can't think of anything more intimidating, actually. But if you just sit down and do it, you know, it, it, some of the fear kind of goes away. And then you get into this rhythm, you get into this momentum. And then, you know, you look down and you've written 3000 words and you, you can't even believe you've done it. So yeah, I guess that's my advice is just forget about everything else, get out of your head and just sit down and write the story. And so when you write like this, when you write the thousand words or 3000 words a day, do the characters take over for you? They I mean, do, do you not yeah. see things coming? So uh, I was, it's funny. I was just having this conversation the other day. I, I did a presentation at a local college and they ask something very similar, but I'm a big outliner. I love to outline. I don't outline short fiction, but I always outline novels. And the funny thing is I will have this outline for the most part completed before I, before I start writing. But the, the final product is maybe 30, 40% of the outline because so Isn't much it? changes, yeah. you know, characters like catch and release is a perfect example. Um, I, I had a, uh, I don't want to get too too into it because it's got a big twist ending. I don't want to give anything away. But the, the third act of that book was completely different from what I had outlined, completely different. Uh, the killer wasn't the killer. It was something else. Um, people who I thought were dead were not dead. People who I didn't think were dead ended up dying. And so I think that's a, the fun part of it too, is you have this plan in your head, but then when you sit down, the characters and the plot and everything kind of comes to life organically and evolves in front of you. It's almost like it's coming through your fingers, you know, as you're typing, you're just kind of the vessel that it comes out. I know that sounds a little silly, but, um, yeah. but for me, you know, I have to outline because otherwise it's way too intimidating and I need to have a roadmap yeah. that I think is going to get me to my destination, even though along the way I might end up in a different town. At least I have an idea where I want to go. That's so cool. Does your publisher know this when you go into 
or do you surprise them a lot? They they just see the final. They don't they don't know they don't oh. uh, they don't know how the sausage is made, right? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's that's totally between great. me and my beta readers and my editor. I think. Oh, so you believe in beta readers too? Yes, I don't use them as much now. I only have one. Uh, at one point, I used to use a group, a small group, um, but now I just have one individual, and he, he and I will both share, um, you know, chapters. We sit down every week, every Thursday, and review them. And he has been fantastic because he's he shared things with me that have completely altered the entire plot of the book, and it's and they've always been better when he's done that. Oh, so that's great! Wow. Yeah. Is he also an author, a writer? Uh, he is. Yes, he is not. Uh, published anything yet but he is uh he's knocking on the door so well, you'll that's have to let cool. us know about him too because absolutely he's giving you this kind of guidance that's great yeah well, he's great well i would like to open this up i know that uh you know we have sarah stami who's she's just left. oh she just left well she was from the pacific she's up in the bellingham washington area she always is uh usually here but uh tracy's here with me in shreveport is there anything you want to ask him about writing Tracy? No, actually, he's kind of said exactly, you know, kind of the same advice that we just, uh, yesterday, um, we went to a kind of like a Waffle House kind of place. This is and, funny. And this, this, this girl was in there and she was a writer and Kathy had all these books that she was going to pass out to all of us and ended up giving most of them to this girl. And this girl is about to start writing. And I gave her the same advice. I said, don't be intimidated because it's an overwhelming experience. I said, you just, you have to just stay at it. And instead of looking at it as writing a whole novel, look at it as writing, you know, 12 or 15 short stories. But yeah. it ended yeah. up all these kids yeah. that were working in this huddle house. It's yeah. like a IHOP breakfast place. We went for coffee, a bunch of authors, friends of mine. And it ended up these kids, okay. it was like, this is the best day of our lives. It really we're going, was. we it get was. to meet all these authors. And they, and it was all because I just had spread these books out on the table and said, hey, look at these books, you know. And because what happens to me is I get sent so many books, but I 1500. can't, 1500 last year, but oh. I can't pick them all, but they're all good. Oh. We lost you for a second. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. I lost you as well. That was weird. Okay. But we're still recording. But um, um, what I was going to say is we, we oftentimes we just get, um, you know, caught up in our lives and the way we think it should go. But then these serendipitous things happen, like these kids, they were going, oh my God, you know, you guys are authors. We were rock stars. We were Ooh. like rock stars. And it was so funny. I go, well, you know, I have a Pulp of Queen chapter here. And they go, no. I go, yeah, it's my charter chapter, Jefferson, Texas. And they go, who's leading it? When I told them, they go, oh, that's my my best friend at school's mom. And I, they go, I go, well, here's my card. Tell her I told you to call. Yeah. And before we left, they were, you could just see they're all waving. And they were so happy. And I'm thinking if every author would just, you know, visit schools or just take a moment to mentor, you know, our authors are really good about doing that. But I think, I think you're, um, we have, so much internet access today there i'm really trying to help make those author connections what is the best author experience you've had with an audience that you that you wish could happen all the time can you think of once where you everything just went oh man this is it huh you know i used to go to unfortunately it it kind of died out with covid but they're bringing it back there was a um a writing convention in Indianapolis every year called Magna Cum Murder. And I think oh, it was never heard of it. Uh, 30 some years uh, in Indianapolis. It started at Ball State University and then it kind of got so big that it moved off. Almost went to Ball State. Yeah. Oh yeah. But it's, um they've, they've now, for the last two years, it was defunct because of COVID. They've now rebranded it and they're starting it back up. Uh, cool. It's in weeks. And um that was to me, I've gone, I went 
three years in a row. And it was an incredible experience because they bring in authors from all over the country, but there's yeah. a ton of readers there as well. Um, I know uh, uh, Revis Wortham was there. I, think I was going to say, Revis goes to yeah. one, another one um, in Dallas. Uh, Joe Lansdale was there. Oh, I met him for the first, he's one of my favorite authors. I met him a few years ago, which was fan. It was like the highlight of my career, uh, which was great. He's such a nice guy. Um, but I think it would probably have to be attending those shows because they bring in so many authors and so many readers who are passionate and it's all crime, but it's, you know, you've got uh, the crime thrillers, you've got detective fiction, you've got cozy mysteries. It's like every genre under the sun um, that you can think about, but it's just great access to authors. There's workshop or there's panels. Um, you're having lunch, you know, with, uh, with fans and it's, it's great. It's, it's like a much smaller, like voucher con. I mean, it's not voucher con is so big. Um, it, it can, that can be extremely intimidating, but it's just, it's, I don't know. It's just a great experience. So it'd, it'd probably be that. That's kind of, that's kind of like our girl from weekend. Everybody goes, Oh, it's just girls. I go, no, it's not, but, it's not. but that gets the guys to come. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what I was going to tell you is that there is a fabulous bookstore in Houston that has provided books for me for years at my convention called murder by the book. Have you ever been um, there? I've heard of it. Oh, you got to go because you know one in Dallas. Too, that's the, I don't that, know the one Will in Dallas had a signing that was like de something detective something. I don't know, but Murder by the Book, they you know, they get all the greats and it was so funny when my book came out, they said, "Would you like to have a book signing?" And I go, "Well, um first of all, I'm not suspense or murder or crime." They go, yeah, but you feature those books. So yeah. every time I had a new book out, they always came, you know, invited me down. In fact, that was the last event I did before COVID was I went to Murder by the Book with six of my authors. And it was really weird because when we got down there, they had a flood and there was no water in Houston. So uh -huh. we went to go get, some coffee before the book signing every coffee shop was closed there's no water i go what this is houston what do you mean there's no water there's no water and we just couldn't believe it it it, it was the weirdest thing but uh if you get a chance to go there uh the young woman who uh runs it she's brilliant and she does podcasts and all kinds of stuff with like you know john grisham and all these big guy, big wig wigs but she does a lot of new authors too so i highly recommend murder by the book and um and it's fun to go to houston houston's got houston's a, a great town i love it got big I, my biggest one of my biggest pulp queen chapters is in the houston area so they're all going to be a girlfriend weekend this year so um i i just you know any final words you want to share with uh the people that are going to be listening on YouTube, because this will be posted on there by tomorrow morning. I hope I'm been I'm a little behind on getting things posted, but um, uh, then everybody it's up there permanently, and everybody can share it with the world and have watch parties. And I will make sure you know everybody knows to go on your uh, podcast or your blog tomorrow, read all about, tell the stories. Uh, you know, you need to tell them more about that white boy. That that's <laughs> That just kind of, I'll be having nightmares about that tonight, but. Uh, my yeah. house is not haunted. No, it's but not. But it's old. My house is really old. And by the way, it's on a golf course. Yeah, uh -huh. it is. That Ben Hogan used to play on. She's. Oh, really? Right out the back door right is the, the green. Back door is well, it's not, maybe it's not haunted yet. You never know. No. Maybe Ben but, Hogan. Hmm. Has there ever been a book about a haunted golf course? Oh, I'm sure there has. <laughs> I don't I feel like that's got cozy mystery written all over it. I don't know. I don't think there'd be anything cozy about knowing I'm not I I lived at a country club growing up because I was a lifeguard. And you know, people were either getting hit in the head with a golf ball or struck by lightning. Oh my this god. In Kansas, you know. So, you know, I can't tell you how many people I got hit in the head with a golf club. My and neighbor almost got hit in the head by a golf ball. She was she was um cleaning off her roof. And a golf ball hit about two feet from or on top of the roof. Oh, God. Nine in stitches house. in my head. And it, they told me if it had been an iron, it would have killed me. Oh, but it God. was wood. 
but anyway, uh, yeah, there you go. There's a there's a little rabbit hole you can go down and see if you can Google that. I've never heard of a haunted golf course, but I'm thinking of all these. I know a million golf stories. Because you got a bill, and then and then you know you get you get Bill Murray to star in it. It's great. There you go. Oh my God! Get her on the back nine. There you yeah. Go. yeah. Uh, terror on the back nine but this think how many country clubs in this country you could do book signings at there you go there yeah you go. well th speaking of the white boy i had i had thought about one of my blogs later this week i'm going to talk a little bit about that and the kind of the story behind it just because i you know i feel like halloween's coming up and it's a good time to talk about those kind of things so yes. you'll get a little did, more detail about that did i ask you before do you know grady hendrix hendrix do you know i him? do not no. Okay, he's one of our authors too, and he's so out there, and all of his books are being bought up. He's got a new one about a haunted house, but the one that we read, oh gosh, the title's going to escape me, but it was the one where um, these women are in a book club, and they notice that their next door neighbor has a young man move in who's a nephew in a in a van that has no windows. Oh, and creepy. it's oh my gosh what's the name of the book and he's a vampire oh really uh, and but it's told through the eyes of this southern book club i'm telling you it was i couldn't put the book down i had the creeps and i just picked up stephen king's latest book fairy tale i haven't started it yet but i can't wait to read it but um i love all of my favorite books are not the horror ones i like you know rita hayworth and shawshank redemption yeah Yes, but Joyland was a great uh, one of uh, Stephen King books. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, well, you know, maybe someday we'll get this Netflix thing done. You know, you never, the yeah, white. Yeah, you should come with us to Sundance. Yeah, we're going to Sundance. We're, we're going, going to Sundance. Sundance. We're She's going to make the, the, the party rounds, which is really, they're really not like crazy parties. They're mixers with producers and writers and directors and she's written that. a book set at Sundance called the darlings of Sundance. Yeah. And it's, it's nice. pretty good. And well, it's real, it's great. I, it's, I was just going to say, it's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, just like your book. I mean, everybody says to me, well, you never do any bad reviews. And I go, listen to me, people. I have written a book. And if you've ever written a book, it is hard as hell to write a book. I would never diss anybody for any book ever written, even though I could do the top five worst books I've ever read. And uh, they're pretty, um, the, they're amazing. You know, I can't even believe where people come up with this stuff. But it takes a lot to write a book and it takes it an really enormous does. amount of time and sacrifice. I would never say anything bad about a book, but if it gets to be my book club, you're all five diamonds. You're all the highest mark, you know, to yeah, kill a mockingbird. 1,500 books. You, you, she's only picked 48 of them. 48 is what I pick. And there may be a few little extras because I've got some teen books coming to me that are pretty amazing. If, so, you, if, you, if you slide her a, a $10 no, bill. No, <laughs> I, I, no. I don't want that no. ever to be said. Nobody, I've had no, people make offers to them. me. No, I, a book is chosen on merit. Yeah. It has nothing to do with whether a celebrity or how much money they've got or how much they want to bribe me. I, I've told some pretty big people, I'm not picking your book because I didn't like it, you yeah. know, and I'm, yeah. I'm really honest about that. And people go, well, who are you to say? And I go, listen, I bet I've read more books than most people. I think you've ever. read more books than anybody that I know. All 1500 of those books I looked at. Now I cannot, I can't read that many books in a year, but I read an awful lot of books. So uh, I read yours. I loved it. I can't wait to read these two new that I know about. And Same you've got a third one you're working on. Can yeah, I'm working. It's the third in the Connor Harding series. It's due to my editor. I think November, it's either the 9th or the 16th. And I, uh, I think I've still got three chapters to write and then I got to go through and edit everything. And there's a lot of stuff I want to take out, some things I want to change. So yeah, I'm under the gun. Well, if there was one thing you could say about that book that would be a tease to get people to want to read it, what would that be? Gosh, um, that would be, so my protagonist goes out West He's in Wyoming. He's to be, he's from Boston. He travels mm -hmm. to Wyoming to find a kidnapped girl 
who has been um, uh, ensnared in a child trafficking ring. Oh gosh, yeah, so, yeah. It was it's, it was a tough book to research, um, especially having kids myself. But um, I think it's uh, I, I like the story. Uh, I think it's a really good story, uh, and it's called The Wicked Side. Um, and the it, Wicked Side. Yeah, Did you watch book. Longmire on Netflix? I love Longmire. Yeah. Um, and I, the, the funny thing is I was originally, when I had outlined this book years ago, it was going to be set in the hollers of Kentucky. Oh, yeah. And because I kind of needed a remote place. Yeah, a remote setting. And then I went to Wyoming for vacation that year and fell in love with it. Absolutely loved it. And I thought, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to move it and I'm going to set it in Wyoming. So that's what I did. So, cause it's just as remote as anything else. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a good book. I'm really, uh, I'm really, I, I see everybody listening the next yeah. Longmire. Okay. Yeah. The next, because I was so sad when that movie was, uh, series yeah. was over because, and I didn't really like how it ended, but I did love the story about the native American Indians and the local sheriff and, the uh, the camaraderie between all the, I did too. Uh, it was fascinating. Yeah. And they was a great series. so many, you know, topics that were you know really kind of almost taboo uh, but very well done i thought so yeah. i can't wait i can't wait trace yeah. this has been awesome Good. so we'll see you tomorrow on the pulp queen presents her picks on the blog and you have sunday through sunday a lot of people don't do it on the weekends but if you want the more you post out there the more you're going to get out there and um uh, we want everybody to be reading your books. And, you know, if I have, I have to live to be a really long time to do, because now to go back and read, you've got six before five will die, right? Seven? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, I've had um, three of the Finn series, uh, the White Boy, which is a standalone, I'm and then that. two others in the Connor series, and then Sorry, one in the Connor series and then five will die. And then after that, I published another one in the Connor series. And then the um, the book that's due to my editor will be the third in the Connor Harding series. So I please hope that you'll send me the white boy and catch and release because I, I really want to read them. And I think you've got some great stories to tell. And I'm so thrilled that you're here. It's been an honor and privilege. Yeah. And, uh, and if you want to go to any book festivals, we're planning on going... To Tennessee all of them. Williams. Tennessee Williams is one of my Great. favorite ones in the whole wide world. And talk about, you know, they love, you know, that kind of thing down in Southern Gothic or yeah. suspense or whatever. Yeah. It's a fun festival because it also involves actors and they bring in amazing people. Uh, I can't believe some of the actors <laughs> I've got to meet there. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us. And I will... It's being recorded and we'll get it up on the Pulp Queen channel on YouTube. So subscribe, Excellent. subscribe. I already, and already have. Family. Thank you so make much it, for having me. Make it a Halloween special to watch Steve McQueen in the blob. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on the list. Okay. Tell Thanks. the family hi and thank you so much. Will do. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Tracy. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Okay.